my word for the year was bold. And it has definitely been a bold year, although completely different from what I anticipated. I expected myself to be more bold on the outside, externally and visibly. But instead, this year has been more about catching up with the fast growth of the previous two years and having a bolder mindset. It all makes sense in hindsight, but there were definitely times where I felt I was not living up to my word for the year. As I was writing this review, I feel immensely grateful for everything that has happened this year, and I can absolutely see how it is helping me to become ready for a new and bold decade. 2019 was a big travel year, and I loved every minute of it. I spent 122 days at home in Switzerland, 83 days at my second home in Iceland, and 100 58 days on the road. What may sound exhausting to you was exciting to me. I love traveling and it's one of the reasons I wanted to build an online business. I don't want to have a local team or a local office. I want to be able to work whenever and wherever. And that's what I'm doing and I'm loving it. In January, I started the year off being in Iceland, in Reykjavik, at my home there. Then I was in Switzerland, in Zurich, and we did another Samba launch. And then I flew four days to Toronto, where Lynn, my launch manager, lives, and I spent a few days with her. And then I went to Phoenix for a retreat, mastermind retreat. In February, I was four days in Laguna Beach with my other business coach at another mastermind retreat. Then I was a week in Iceland. Then I spent only a few days in Zurich. And then I was seven days on a skiing holiday in the south of Switzerland in a town called Nanda. Then I was back in Zurich for a few days to wrap up February. In March, I went three days to Amsterdam. Martin wanted to attend to a concert there. Then we were four days in Zurich. And then again, I was 10 days in Reykjavik. I love to go to Reykjavik to be with my parents and my family. So I always try to squeeze it in wherever I can on my travels. So straight from Reykjavik, I went four days to Phoenix. This was a content workshop with Ali Brown, so not a mastermind retreat. Then I was two days in San Diego where I attended Social Media Marketing World. Actually, I was only able to catch the second day of this two-day conference because I was still at the content workshop with Ali. Then I was three days in London where I met with my mastermind buddies. I am in a self-led mastermind since several years. That's basically my third mastermind. And we tried to meet up once a year in London, and that was that. Then I was again a few days in Reykjavik, because, you know, why not fly to Reykjavik when you're already in London? And then I went back to Zurich to wrap up March. In April, I was a couple of days in Zurich, and then we were 12 days in Dubai on a vacation, where half the day we played golf and half the day I was creating an amazing new course for my Samba community. Then I was a couple of days in Zurich before I flew one day to Amsterdam, where I attended Michelle Obama's uh, book reading or launch. And I also had a meetup for uh, my Samba students in the Netherlands. Then I was five days in Alicante, which was basically our Easter holiday with my stepsons visiting Martin's mother, Martin is my husband, and his sister. Then we were back in Zurich for four days. Then we did a nice weekend, Ascona. Ascona is in the Italian part of Switzerland before we were back in Zurich. And I had to fly again to Phoenix for another two-day mastermind retreat, which wraps up April and starts March. Then I was about two weeks in Zurich before I went on a four-day trip to Valencia. Once a year, I go on a trip with my three best friends from my studies in Germany. We call it Mädelswochenende. And then I was back for a week in Reykjavik, Iceland, again to see my family there before we went on a week golf holiday in Austria in a little town called Brand. And that wraps up May. 
Are you getting tired? <laughs> in June, I was three days in Chicago for a mastermind retreat with my other business coach before I was four days in Zurich and again one week in Nanda, Switzerland, where I hosted a VIP mastermind retreat. So typically my VIP mastermind retreats are in January in Zurich and October in Zurich again, but in June, we rent this amazing uh, VIP chalet uh, for the retreat. Then I was about two weeks in Zurich again before I spent a long weekend again in Brand, Austria. So you can see a pattern here. We're typically going to the same places again and again. In July, I was a week in Zurich before we almost moved to Iceland. So the whole school holiday of my stepsons, we spend in Iceland. That's about five weeks. So that's about three and a half weeks of July and again, uh, two weeks of August before they have to go back to school. And then I spent about 10 days in Zurich again before I had to go back to Iceland and we ran in the Reykjavik Marathon, not in the actual marathon, but in the 3K fun run. I ran actually with my clients. And then I ran Mastermind Retreat Iceland, a six-day retreat in south of Iceland. And this was my very last retreat because now I'm focusing on something else. And this wraps up August. We come into September. I start being in Reykjavik. And then I fly three days to Phoenix. Again, a Mastermind Retreat. And then... 25 days in New York, again, one day in Phoenix for a VIP day with Ali Brown. And then we go into October where we wrap up another week in New York. And then I spend the longest time of the whole year, 26 days in Zurich. That's because in October I run Sigrun Life, which is a once a year, an annual event for my Samba and Mastermind community. Plus, we had the team fly in from all over the world in the days leading up to the event. And after the event, we had a retreat with our VIP clients. So yes, I had to be Zurich the whole time. It didn't mean that I was at home the whole time. Out of that time, I was about a week in a hotel because we like to stay at the conference hotel. In November... Started off going to San Diego. That was, again, a mastermind retreat. Right afterwards, three-day Phoenix. Uh, this was iconic, uh, an event with uh, Ali Brown that she's been doing annually. But uh, this was, unfortunately, the last one. Otherwise, I would recommend you go there. Then I did nine days in Los Angeles as I was waiting for another workshop I was doing in there. And then I came four days to Zurich before I went on a transatlantic cruise for 18 days. That wraps up November and starts the beginning of December. On this transatlantic cruise, I went to Genoa, Marseille, Barcelona, and Malacca in Europe before we spent five consecutive days at sea. And then we were in the Caribbean where I went to Barbados, Antigua, Saint Martin, Martinique, and Guadeloupe. And as I'm recording this, I've been spending uh, five days in Zurich uh, last week. Last weekend, we were in Stuttgart. We always go to Stuttgart before Christmas. And this time, I was able to also arrange for a meetup and met some uh, people from the Samba and Mastermind community. A uh, few days in Zurich again before I go and spend four days in Alicante with, again, Martin's mother and sister. And then we go off to Reykjavik and spend Christmas there. And yes, did this make you tired? It doesn't make me tired. It makes me excited, as you can hear. The biggest traveling highlight of the year was going on a transatlantic cruise. I had been on a cruise before. I went on a cruise in 2016, Abram Hicks in Alaska, and I've done a special episode on that that you can also listen to if you haven't already. But Martin, my husband, had never been on a cruise before. And since we are planning to go on a three-week Antarctica cruise in 2022 to celebrate our 10-year wedding anniversary, Martin wanted to go on a cruise once before to see if he liked it. Turns out, we both loved it, especially the days at sea. On my previous cruise, there were two separate days at sea, but on this transatlantic cruise, as I said before, there were five consecutive days at sea. There was something magical about crossing the Atlantic, the soft movement of the ship, the endless sea with not a single ship in sight. Martin and I were both able to completely relax and recharge, which was so needed 
after a busy year, as you could hear from the traveling schedule, we are now even more excited about Dream Cruise in 2022, where we will travel to Antarctica and I will make my dream of seeing penguins in their natural habitat a reality. But let's rewind back to the end of 2018. I was feeling tired. In August 2018, I started a brand new group coaching and accountability program called Samba Momentum. And I was also running four mastermind groups, two Momentum masterminds, one Accelerator mastermind, and one VIP mastermind. The plan was to retire the two Momentum masterminds in favor of the new Samba Momentum program. But for four months, I was running five group programs instead of ideally only three. I was running too many programs and I was running out of energy. And I realized it. The year was coming to an end, so I knew I could pull through, but I began to wonder about 2019. In October 2018, I started to think about merging two of my higher level masterminds, Accelerator and VIP, into one program. I wanted to have more space and time in my calendar to be creative create more content, and finally write a book. Instead of taking a swift decision, I went back and forth whether I should merge Accelerator and VIP into one program or wait and see how many signups I would get. To say that I agonized over this is an understatement. Since I was so indecisive on what to do, I also didn't do my best at marketing both programs. And suddenly it was almost Christmas and I realized that I had to make a decision. On December 23rd, after one more sleepless night over this decision, I finally sent an email to those who had signed up for both of these programs and announced to them that I was merging them together. Of course, Accelerator members were ecstatic about the change because I was upgrading them to VIP, but I didn't feel so good for those who had already signed up for VIP, so I gave them an extra bonus. I felt relieved after the decision like I do every time I have a big decision in my business. And then I thought to myself, why didn't I make this decision right away in October? But that's the thing. When you have a big decision, we tend to procrastinate on them. And that's a part of growing pains. Besides merging two programs, I also had to take a hard look and see if there was anything that I could stop doing or at least pause for a while. Already in October, I stopped recording new episodes for Sick Room Sparks, which is a 90-second daily audio experience. Still today, my team is running the 100 episodes that I created from May to September 2018. In my mind, I've just paused the production of new episodes, and when the time is right, I will start again. End of December, I didn't have energy to record any new episodes for my podcast, The Sick Room Show, So we reran older episodes that I felt were good, but hadn't received the downloads that I felt they deserved. And this turned out to be actually a good idea. I didn't have to record about 10 episodes, and these episodes got a new life on my podcast and more downloads. The decision to stop something, merge something, or pause something are not easy, but I feel through this experience in 2018 and 19 that I'm much more willing to take a decision like this and make it faster than I did before. But I had also other growing pains (laughs) through 2019. It had been clear since I tripled my revenue from 340,000 to a million in 2017 that I needed to grow my team, but I hadn't. There was something holding me back and I couldn't pinpoint what it was. Was I worried about the investment? Not really, but maybe a tiny bit. Was I worried about not finding the right people? Partly yes, as I had hired and fired a lot of contractors over the years. Was I worried about the time it takes to train them? A little bit. Was I worried about changing the team dynamic? Somewhat, I guess. But overall, I didn't have a clear answer on why I wasn't growing my team when we so obviously needed more help to achieve all the goals that I wanted to achieve. As I stood in front of my mastermind group in February 2019, explaining to them my vision and listing all my goals for 2019, I realized that my biggest thing holding me back was my resistance to growing my team. 
My mastermind bodies were amazed how far I have grown. My business was such a small team, but it was crystal clear to everyone in the room that the only way I was going to achieve my goals was to build a bigger team. Then one of my mastermind buddies, who rarely speaks up unless he has something important to say, said, Sigrun, I think the reason you're not growing your team is that you want to prove to the world, to women, that you, as a woman, can do it all on your own. Boom. That hit me. Yes, I want to prove to myself and prove to other women that they can do it. And my mastermind buddy continued, Sigrun, you've already proven you can do it. You've built a million dollar business. Boom. Yes, yes, I have. Now build a dream team to achieve your vision, she said. She hit the nail on the head and I felt something being released. Maybe the resistance was now less. Interestingly enough, the day before that memorable hot seat, I had actually written and published three job descriptions. And then we took our time with hiring. The ad was up for over a month. We got over 300 applications and then my team interviewed potential clients. And then we gave them tests to complete. We ended up hiring four employees instead of three, although a few months later we had to let one of them go. Overall, I added five members to my team in 2019, plus I hired an event manager as a contractor and four new coaches for my programs. Today, I feel no, zero resistance to growing the team. Actually, I feel the opposite. I'm constantly thinking about what role I want to fill next And if I know someone that I could potentially hire, I'm really enjoying building a dream team. And that concludes Growing Pains for 2018 and 19. But I let some dreams come true in 2019. And some dreams that I didn't even know that I had. In February, I said to my husband, I would love to live in New York for a month. Let's do it, he said. A few hours later, we found the perfect studio apartment in the middle of Manhattan. The dream of living somewhere else for a month was no longer a dream. And maybe it hadn't been a dream for a long time before that. But it was going to happen, and it happened in September 2019. We moved to New York for a month without big plans. Interestingly enough, I got several invitations to events, even if I didn't tell anyone that I was going to be in New York. Somehow... The universe sent me people or events that happened exactly during the time I was in New York. And of course, I took an advantage of that. But the first thing we did when we arrived was to set up our office space. We were really moving to New York to to live there. We were going to work there. And as luck would have it, there were two tables in our studio and two monitors. We still had to get a few things like a stand for my microphone so I could record podcast episodes and keyboards that we hadn't thought of bringing with us from Switzerland. But Martin didn't mind going shopping because all these things you could get at B&H, which is our favorite, favorite shop in New York. I think he went there at least four times during our stay, our month stay in New York, or maybe even more often. I am not sure. I can't count it anymore. But quickly we established a routine in our new home for a month. Martin would go to Starbucks in the morning and get latte macchiato for himself and chai tea latte with almond milk for me. We would work in the morning from 9 to 12 p.m. and then go to lunch for to one of the local restaurants around our apartment building. We would then work in the afternoon from 1 p.m. to maybe 6 p.m. and then go out for dinner. Our studio apartment actually had a decent kitchen, but we both don't like to cook and New York just has so many great restaurants that we needed to check out. The view from our apartment was to die for. So even if you just want to check out that picture, go to the blog post at the show notes. I took a picture every morning and every evening, but I also used the opportunity to uh, use that studio and the view for the photo shoot. So very quickly after we arrived, I had a styling session with Elsa, my stylist, which uh, this was our second time we worked together. And right the day after, 
This was our first weekend in New York. We did a photo shoot inside the apartment and with a wonderful view in the background. And then my photographer, my US photographer, suggested we do another photo shoot outside. And we managed to do that the last weekend we were in New York. September turned out to be a great month. The weather was nice. We could even sit outside and go to some rooftop bars. And also there's a lot of events and things happening. It's kind of like after the summer period where people are back to work and there's a lot of action in New York. The first event I went to was Marie Forleo's book launch in New York, where I met some fellow B-schoolers. I actually did B-school back in 2013. And I met some fans, some people that kind of said, oh, well, you're a Sigrun. I also met with John Briggs, who does trailers for people like Mark Schaefer and Gary Vee, and is doing a trailer for me too. He introduced me to Steve Cohen, the most connected man in the world and producer for the Altucher Show. Steve then invited me to attend two events with James Altucher. One was where he did stand-up comedy, and the second one was with Ryan Holiday, where they were discussing his new book. At that event, I met Derek Halpern, who sat down at my table, and then I was invited to Selena Sue's VIP networking dinner with 30 entrepreneurs and media people. You may or may not know the people I've mentioned now, but my point isn't the name dropping, but the fact that you can meet so many people in New York is truly amazing. No wonder a lot of entrepreneurs live in New York. But besides the highlight of living in New York for a month, the thing that I remember probably the most when it comes to health or personal life is my new eye. 2019 was the year that I finally, finally had the eye operation that I knew that I needed to have. Since six years, I've known that I have a cataract in my right eye. I did see it coming. It happened gradually. I was having all kinds of issues on my right side of my body, which were not all explainable. So I thought about going to the eye doctor. The eye doctor didn't see anything wrong with my right eye. So I asked him to look again. And then he shouted, you have cataract. I was in shock. Isn't that something that 70 to 80 year old people get? Now, obviously there are exceptions and I'm one of them. The eye doctor wanted to operate right away, but I didn't trust this local eye doctor that is just in the next village to me. I believed him when he said I had a cataract, but I didn't think that I wanted to go under the knife with someone who operates maybe once a month. So I decided to get a second and a third opinion. And through that, the common conclusion was that I should wait. Both the doctors that I saw later told me that Yes, it's not so bad. If you can live with this, if this doesn't disturb you in daily life, then go on and wait a bit. And I also wanted to wait because I was reading up on cataract operations and I saw there was something called multifocal lens. And it didn't look like it was really popular at the time, six years ago when this was discovered. So I felt if I wait... I have bigger chances of actually getting this better option, this treatment that I want, this multifocal lens. But what nobody told me is that you shouldn't wait too long. Earlier in 2019, I had lost all sight on my right eye. I saw a bit of color, but that was it. It was like looking through white paperback. Go and check for yourself. You don't see much, I can tell you. My husband also noticed that my right eye was just, you know, wandering off when he was talking to me. Also, my photographer in Switzerland would see that that I wouldn't look straight. Uh, So we saw this now in pictures. It was time to have that eye operation. In July, I had an appointment at an eye clinic in Zurich. They did all kinds of tests on my right eye. But it was very hard to measure anything because my right eye was like a paperback white paperback where I don't, didn't see anything. And the results were devastating, even more shocking than having a cataract in the first place. You cannot have the multifocal lens that I doctor said. I was in shock and I cried when I got outside the eye clinic. I had waited too long. 
But I had been waiting too long to get the right treatment, and I was not willing to take no for an answer. So I asked for a second appointment with the head doctor of the clinic. An appointment was set up for August, and I flew especially from Iceland to Switzerland for that appointment. And at the clinic, I was first sent to a different doctor who told me about a test that I have to do to simulate the eye operation. And I asked again to see the head doctor. And after a bit back and forth, I finally was able to see her. And she agreed that I would get a multifocal lens, the treatment that I originally wanted. So a date was set for eye surgery, Tuesday, October 8th, 2019. According to the eye doctors, all went well, but it took me a few days to recover. Within two days, I could see 100% with my right eye, and it was amazing to be able to read a book or sit at a computer without needing any glasses. A few days later, though, my eyesight dropped to 60%. I noticed as we were driving that I couldn't read the motorway signs anymore. The eye doctors had warned me that because my cataract was so strong that I would most definitely have to have a post-cataract eye laser operation about three months after the first operation. But instead of waiting three months, the eye doctor decided to do the second operation only three weeks after the first operation to improve my eyesight. The date for the second operation was set for November 18th, 2019, and I felt an immediate improvement. And in the eye test that I did right afterwards, I guessed that my eyesight was about 80%. And just before Christmas 2019, I was invited for a final check, and then my eyesight had improved even more, and now I have 100% eyesight on my right eye. What a relief after everything. And now I just need to have the left eye operated at some point in the future, but definitely not in 2020. There isn't a year in review from a business coach without talking about numbers. When I read other people's year in review blog posts, I'm always curious whether they will reveal their numbers or not. And I think they should, even if they're not a business coach, because we need to talk about numbers and especially women. We need to share our revenue numbers and inspire each other to aim higher. I am sharing my numbers in a lot of detail here with you because I want to inspire you to think bigger and also get realistic about revenue, profits, costs of running an online business. So total revenue in 2019 was over 2 million. The 2019 results were 500,000 revenue increase from 2018, which is over 30% growth. I started the year aiming to double the revenue from 1.5 million in 2018 to 3 million in 2019, but already by the end of January, I adjusted the projection to 2.5, so I'm pretty happy with our results especially considering all the issues we've had with Facebook ads in all of our launches this year. The revenue for Samba in 2019 was similar to our Samba revenue in 2018, and the key growth area was my new group coaching and accountability program, Samba Momentum. Samba revenue was $1.1 million in 2019. Although it wasn't our original plan, my team and I did three Samba launches in 2019, the original plan was to do two launches, like in 2018, but in January and June instead of January and September. Our reasoning was that it would be good to have people start just before we run our 60-day summer challenge inside Samba called Samba Summer School. But our June launch didn't work out the way we wanted, partly due to Facebook ads and partly due to the heat wave that went over Europe in the week of our launch. Yes, it's amazing. A heat wave actually influences sales. And that's why we added a September launch and overall we were able to close off with over a million dollars in Samba revenue for 2019. But to our Facebook ads, troubles and issues, because we are not alone here. They actually started already back in September 2018 when we hit an invisible daily ad spending limit and couldn't spend our ad budget. 
Despite talking to three Facebook ad experts, none of them could figure out what was happening. It was actually Martin, my husband, who knows nothing about Facebook ads that figured out that there must be a limit on our daily spend, even if we didn't see it in our settings. Our Facebook ad manager was skeptical that this was the reason, but after checking with Facebook, turns out that Martin was right and Facebook was willing to increase our invisible daily ad spend. Unfortunately, this was already on our open card day, so it was too late. In the three launches in 2019, our Facebook ad issues were around disapproval of ads. And probably you've heard about that already, especially if you're running ads yourself. We've had to completely change the language of our ad copy, also our landing pages and sales pages to get through the eagle eye of Facebook ad approval. Getting a lot of ads disapproved has increased our costs, so overall lead cost has gone up in all the launches. And a lot of time has been spent on writing ad copy that can get improved. So this is a change to previous launches where we could often reuse our ad copy month after month or year after year. Now we are always tweaking it in every launch. In our latest launch, we feel we finally got to the bottom of it and have ads that are getting approved without getting the disapproval first. And currently our Facebook ads are running smoothly. So fingers crossed. Our mastermind group revenue was over 1 million. In 2019, we ran two group programs, Samba Momentum, a group coaching and accountability program and VIP Mastermind, a true mastermind program. Both are 12 month programs, but the sales process is very different. VIP Mastermind starts once a year in January. Momentum on the other hand starts at any time. Most of our mastermind group clients come from Samba and therefore we don't need to run any ads or launch these two programs. We also get a few clients just through word of mouth or through referrals. In January 2020 starts a new program, Red Circle, which is for women who are already making 500,000 and more and want to aim for the million dollars in 2020. Other revenue streams in 2019 uh, were of course Selfmade Summit, my biggest and boldest project to date happening in June in Reykjavik, Iceland. We soft launched our super early bird tickets during Second Live in October and they sold out in 48 hours. Net profit for 2019 was 10% or just over $200,000. When most online entrepreneurs talk about profit, they actually mean salary. And they even sometimes call it take home profit. They run their businesses as sole proprietorship and any profit they make is actually their salary. I've always run my business as a limited liability company and therefore any profit my company makes is not my salary, but a profit that belongs to the company. In some countries, it makes sense to pay yourself dividends from your company profit, but in Switzerland, that doesn't make sense because they tax dividends double. First, you pay tax on your company profit before you can pay yourself dividends, and then you pay income tax on the dividends. So the best way that I can pay myself salary, well, or any kind of money out of the business is through salary and not profit. When I talk about profit, I mean company profit always. After salary, after all your costs, after company taxes, after depreciation of company assets, and after any currency losses or gains. And that's a very different profit than the one most online entrepreneurs talk about. I actually don't want a lot of profit in my business. A 5% profit is more than enough for a business that I never plan to sell. Instead, I want to invest any potential profit into the growth of my business before the year end. This investment can be in form of a new project, like a venue for my conference, larger ad budget, expanding my team, creating an investment fund, whatever it is, something that grows the business for the future. So next time you hear someone talk about profit, ask them what kind of profit they're talking about. Are they talking about salary or profit? If I would actually go ahead and calculate profit like most online entrepreneurs do, I could easily have a 40 or 50% profit in my business, but that would not be smart business or tax wise. And that's why I don't do it. In 2019, total cost was uh, 1.9 million. Employees and contractors 
were 700,000. Yeah, a big number. The biggest expense in my business is paying people. This includes me and my husband, all employees, all contractors, and all outsourced tasks. My team now consists of four full-time employees, eight part-time employees and contractors, two people podcasting team, four external coaches, and I regularly work with photographers and videographers. In addition, we have several tasks that we outsource, transcription services, and many more. And it basically gives me great joy to be able to employ people. And now that I've gotten over my assistance of growing my team, I am loving building a dream team, and paying good salaries. And if you're curious, I pay myself a six-figure salary since 2017. For the first three years of my business, I didn't pay myself any salary, so I'm making up for that now. In my business, we run a live event. This is for our Samba and Mastermind community. It's a free event for them. And I want to talk about costs like that because people often don't realize what an event costs. Just running Sigrun Live every year in October, and I'm specifically talking about uh, this October 2019, our live event cost was 120000 So this two-day event is one day for Sombas, two days for Masterminders, and we invest to get the team in for a whole week create an amazing two-day event. And in 2020, we're even planning to make it into a three-day event. Two-day event for Sambas, three-day events for masterminders. And the costs are going to go up. But I absolutely believe that having a live event as a part of your program is worth it because that's how we've been able to build an amazing community and movement uh, where most of our clients call themselves Team Red. In order to uh, attract leads, we spent uh, Facebook ads. We've talked about our Facebook ad issues here before. We spent about 200,000 on Facebook ads in 2019. And when my clients ask me which amount they should invest into Facebook ads, I tell them investing 10% of the revenue you want to have in your launch is pretty normal. If you want to have a million dollar launch, you need to be willing to invest 100,000 into paid ads. In 2019, we spent 10% of our total revenue on Facebook ads, and that is a bit too much. But that basically happened because of all the disapprovals and the issues we had with Facebook ads, which, uh, you know, made the cost creep up. Also, in order to attract more clients, we uh, work with affiliates. We have worked with our affiliates since our very first Samba launch in June 2017, all our affiliates are former or current Samba students or mastermind members and know the Samba program in and out. Their success stories are the best proof for the effectiveness of the program, and we pay them a 40% commission of every Samba sale. As I've shared earlier on this podcast, if you've been listening it for a while, I absolutely believe investing forward. And in 2019, I spent 90000 on two mastermind programs. And every year, I have increased my investment. Now, I didn't plan to, to be in two mastermind groups, but I've talked about that in another episode, why that happened. But basically, one mastermind was 40000 and the other one 50000 But I believe that if you want to add 500000 to your annual revenue, you need to be willing to invest 50000 into coaching. And besides Mastermind, I also invest into coaching in other areas of my business and consulting where it's needed. For instance, event consulting, learning about how to do events. That's a part of what is not included in this number, but was included in another number. I want to talk about travel. Travel is a big part of my life and business. This is one of the reasons I started my business in the first place. I always wanted to be able to live in two countries and travel the world. And 90% of my travel is for business, and therefore my travel costs are probably higher than in most online businesses. For 2019, travel cost was 150000 Both of my masterminds in 2019 were in the United States, so I did a lot of trips to the United States. 
A part of the travel cost is travel that my team has taken. I've always had a virtual team, but in 2019 was the first year we brought the team together and more than once. In February, I flew to Toronto to work with my launch manager. And in June, I flew my launch manager and my new executive assistant to Zurich. And for my live event in October, I flew in team members from United States, Canada, Italy, and the United Kingdom to Switzerland. And under travel cost also falls accommodation on meals. But I cannot end a year in review without talking about the Selfmade Summit. The seats had been set for a while. I knew that one day I would do a conference, but I didn't know when or what it would be about. October 2018, I started to feel ready. My VIP mastermind clients were in Iceland with me, and I decided to show them Harpa, the Icelandic concert hall. If you haven't heard or seen Harpa, then just imagine the Sydney Opera House and then a more modern version with a glass facade at the harbor of Reykjavik, Iceland. That's Harpa. Harpa was built between 2007 and 2011, and I originally studied architecture and was therefore fascinated by Harpa from day one. I love the outer structure of the glass facade, how it changes with the seasons, sunlight and artificial light. It is a building that's been praised in magazines around the world, not just for its looks, but also for its sound. Harpa was designed as a concert center, but equally works as a conference center. It has many multifunctional event spaces, plus the main concert hall called Eldborg, which translates to Fire City. When I saw Eldborg the first time, I had to catch my breath. It was so beautiful and fiercely red, and I instantly knew it. This was my event space. So when my VIP mastermind clients came to Iceland in October 2018, I decided to show them my dream event space. I booked us a tour of the building and then we came into the red room called Eldborg. They fell in love just like me and then asked, Sigrun, when are you going to book it? Now I said, I opened up my laptop later that same day and booked the venue. I put a date on my dream. The rest is just logistics. So 2019 has been quite a journey in terms of the Selfmade Summit. It's been scary, frustrating, annoying, and then again, so exciting that it makes up for everything. I've come up with the concept of the conference, decided on the name, worked with three different event consultants to plan the best conference experience ever, hired an event planner after offers and negotiations from five different event agencies, booked speakers, and sold out super early bird tickets. My team and I have been busy creating one-of-a-kind experience. And I cannot wait to see you in Iceland, June 18th to 19th, 2020. Tickets are on sale now for the Selfmade Summit in Reykjavik, Iceland. And this concludes my year in review for 2019. I wish you happy new year and all the best for the new decade. I wish you a bold 2020 and a bold new decade.